Our lesson from the New Testament is Mark, the first chapter, verses 2 through 15. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were coming out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Jesus was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Remember the story of Noah? On God's command, before the floods came, and to the dismay of the people, ugh, let's start again, take two. Remember the story of Noah? On God's command, before the floods came, Noah builds an ark. And then God tells Noah to load the animals onto the ark two by two. God makes sure Noah includes birds and the creeping things of the ground. Then it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. It rains and rains and rains, flooding the entire earth. Finally, after waiting in the ark for a long time for the water to recede, Noah sends out a dove several times to check to see if it's okay for them to land the boat and to disembark. When the dove finally returns with an olive branch in its beak, Noah knew the waters had receded enough for them to land. But that's not the end of the story. There is an essential part to this story that we hear today in our first scripture reading. Listen to the verse, listen to verse 12 again. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. The covenant with Noah is the first covenant God makes in all of the biblical stories. It is interesting to point out that God makes this covenant with Noah, his family, and all the creatures of the earth for future generations to come. As a church seeking to be mindful of our care of the planet, we find in this story an example of how God cares not only for human beings, but for all the creatures of the earth. God's covenant extends to all of creation. Justin Michael Reed, assistant professor of the Hebrew Bible at Louisville Seminary, writes, quote, 
The fact that God makes a covenant with every living creature for all future generations implies that God maintains some ongoing relationship with every being, human and animal, end quote. One reason we love this story is because of this covenant. It reminds us to keep holding on to hope, even through the storms of life, and that a new tomorrow awaits us. In that tomorrow, God meets us. When you continue to read the Bible, we find that God makes covenants over and over again. God is continually seeking a relationship with humanity, reaching out from the past and into the future. God meets us again and again. While God tries to meet us, sometimes we become unaware or uninterested in our relationship with God. And so the Christian community established Lent, a liturgical season to help bring to the forefront our relationship with God. Traditionally, Lent has been a time when people were encouraged to pray, to fast, and to give alms. Prayer is a time to deepen our relationship with God. Our prayer life is our conversation with God, and it deepens our relationship. Often people give up something for the season of Lent. This is the act of fasting. Some people fast from certain foods. And when you do that, it might put us in touch with the reality of hunger in our world. Other people might fast from the news or social media, or we might fast from our workaholism or ways of jealousy or judgment. We can fast from whatever blocks our relationship with God and with others. Almsgiving is another way to talk about cultivate, cultivating a life of generosity by caring for others in their time of need. We can give our time and our talent and our financial support to various organizations seeking to make life better for all. And we can also think about how our everyday actions can help create a more just, equitable, and sustainable society. And in Lent, we also seek to become followers of the way of Jesus. Lent is a time to become familiar with Jesus again. So who is this Jesus anyway? Who is this Jesus in the Gospel of Mark? Jesus is the new covenant that God is making with humanity. Once again, God meets us where we are by becoming human through the person in Jesus. If you want to learn more about Jesus, take some time this week and read the first chapter of all four Gospels and see what you notice. Matthew's Gospel begins with this long genealogy, like a family tree that one might get from Ancestry.com. The family tree goes back to King David and the great patriarch of the Jewish faith, Abraham. Luke begins with the birth of John the Baptist and the announcement of Mary's pregnancy. Overwhelmed by the blessings of life, Zechariah, who is John's father, and Mary, who is Jesus' mother, break out into song in that first chapter. John's gospel has beautiful poetry connecting Jesus with the great beginning of all creation. All three of these gospels give us this sense that Jesus is an amazing person. The genealogy, the miraculous virgin birth, the connection of Jesus' beginning to the beginning of creation catch our attention to try to impress us. Hear, hear, God is in our midst, they proclaim again and again. God meets us. Well, Mark's gospel has none of that. While the other gospel writers give us a heroic introduction to, of Jesus, Mark's gospel begins Jesus' ministry in obscurity. How do we know that? 
It's all about location, location, location. Jesus, it says in Mark's gospel, is from the town of Nazareth. Ched Myers, a scholar of the New Testament, writes, one would expect the hero to be credentialed through miraculous origins or a solid genealogy. However, Mark stresses Jesus' obscure origins from Nazareth is tantamount to introducing him as Jesus from Nowheresville. Also, please note that Jesus is from Nazareth in Galilee. That is also a basic geographical notation. Galilee, you see, is way up north, far away from Judea, far away from Jerusalem's temple, and the seat of power of both the religious elites and the political class of the Roman Empire. Galilee was also surrounded by cities under the influence of the Greek culture, and the people who lived in Galilee were not predominantly Jewish. And so the Jews from the south, the Jews from Judea, often looked upon the Galilean Jews with suspicion. We could imagine people saying something like, oh, those Galilean Jews, they're not really Jewish. And from scholars and archaeologists, we learn that the people of Galilee were also predominantly poor. So what does this mean that Jesus comes from Galilee? Jesus, the child of God, enters the human drama from a town out of nowhere and begins his ministry in an impoverished region cut off from social and political power. Reverend Liesel Gwyn Garrity writes this about the significance of Galilee. Quote, Jesus begins his ministry with those on the margins. The Gospel of Mark places Jesus with the crowds, showing us that his ministry is one embodied through solidarity with the broken, the poor, and the weary. If God can be present in Galilee, an insignificant place, why wouldn't God meet us here in our town and in our lives? God, in the form of Jesus, meets us where we are. God meets us again and again. God meets us in the story of the promise of Noah after the flood, and God meets us in the story of Jesus proclaiming the good news of the Bible. God meets us again and again. So where might God be meeting you today? Please join with me in this affirmation of faith. We believe in a God who is everywhere and right here, bigger than the sky and in the smallest details, all at once and in every moment. We believe that God meets us where we are, in heartbreak and high hopes, around crowded tables and in quiet homes, in joy and in suffering, in loneliness and in connection in sanctuaries and in living rooms, in marches and in waiting rooms. We believe that nothing we do or leave undone can distance us from God's love. God is forever drawing us close and pulling us in. Again and again, God meets us where we are and invites us into wholeness. Thanks be to God for a love like that.